with us this morning. All right. Peterson had a lot of coffee this morning. Say amen. <laughs> hey, you know, th that's an oddball thing. If you got like some amen thing well enough, go ahead and say it. I mean, we don't have to be a bunch of frozen white people and just say it. <laughs> so, amen. <laughs> okay. There are people watching online in faraway places wondering what's happening. <laughs> and if that's you, we're glad you're with us. Welcome. So as this whole COVID thing has come along, uh, one of the things that I really, really believe about life is every challenge presents opportunities. And throughout the midst of all the conundrums of COVID, the disagreements, the crossfire and all that, um, I've just kept saying to our staff, let's, let's keep seeking God because every challenge presents opportunities, and let's stay close to him. And uh, not trying to be too cute with words, but I thought, you know, let's stay close to the Alpha and the Omega in the midst of the Delta and the Omicron and whatever else is coming next. All right. So we've been in this series. We call it Songs of the Season. If you're here sort of coming into the middle of the movie, we're really glad you're here We've been talking about the original Christmas carols, and they are the songs that come from the hearts of these people who God uses in, in, in incredible ways around the birth of Jesus. So Elizabeth was first, she's John the Baptist's mother, then Mary, then Zechariah, John the Baptist's father. Today we're going to talk about the angels' song. And then next weekend, when nobody's here, and we do live stream only, we're going to talk about Simeon's song. <clears throat> so... This one, the angel song, it's the crescendo of all the songs. I mean, it's like all the previous songs have been expressing things, expressing things, expressing things, but like, where's this all headed? It's all headed to the song that's coming out this morning. This is the angel song. This is the glory to God in the highest song. This is the one that we are invited to come into. It is the resounding message from heaven to us on earth from the light into the darkness, bringing the hope that we so desperately long for. That's the gist of that. So I think all of us live in a soundtrack. You know, to have a little fun with it. You know, when you watch movies, I've thought to myself, life seems so cool just because they put a soundtrack to a guy getting in his car driving to work. Right? We do that stuff, and it's very ordinary, and it doesn't seem very exciting to us, but put a soundtrack to it, and oh man, it's like, wow, this is so exciting. Well, most of us actually have a song or two, a verse or two, a refrain or two that are the soundtrack that you live in. Let me give you some examples. If I'm good, I deserve a good life. That's a soundtrack that a lot of people live in. If I make a bunch of money, I'll be happy. That's a soundtrack that a lot of people live in. I am smart and capable enough to control my life and all that happens. That's a soundtrack, and a lot of people live in it. If I find the right spouse, my life will be complete and fulfilled. That's a soundtrack that a lot of people live in. Here's the thing, do enough living and we will begin to learn that stated explicitly as these are, all of those are false soundtracks. They're not going to hold up. 
And if you're thinking, well, I don't live by those soundtracks, you know, that's what other people do. When life gets hard and you've got tons of internal torque, that torque will be the result of the fact that you've been living by a false soundtrack. So we come to this soundtrack, this glory to God in the highest soundtrack. Luke chapter 2. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, firstborn a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He's the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloths lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. Okay, so you remember Charlie Brown Christmas? And you know, the whole thing is, what's Christmas all about? What's Christmas all about? And then finally, Linus comes up to the stage and he says, and there were shepherds abiding in the fields at night and the glory of the Lord shone around them, et cetera, right? You hear that and you get invited into what's actually happening, what this is actually all about. Now, as I've been saying, here's the problem. About the time, if you've been in church most of your life, about the time you hear this verse, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, this biblical text turns into a fairy tale for you. This biblical text, which is full of significance and importance, seems almost like "'Twas the night before Christmas, and all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. There were shepherds abiding in the fields at night. They were watching their flocks." And Ma and her kerchief and I and my cab had just settled down for a warm winter's nap. You, you just get it all mixed together, like you sentimentalize this, right? It's like the good-looking guy whose wife has passed away, and he and his five-year-old daughter go in a Hallmark movie to the Christmas tree farm and meet the good-looking woman <laughs> whose husband died a couple of years ago. And all of it's just going to fall into that kind of soppy stuff. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) We're going to lose what's really happening if we allow it to fall into that kind of stuff. Okay, so you got primary characters in the story. You got Mary and Joseph. You got angels and shepherds. Those are the primary characters in this account. I've been saying throughout that the whole narrative of all that comes with the birth of Jesus filters out the proud. And this is not an accident. The way the whole thing rolls out, what's happening, who's involved, where it's happening, how it's happening. And then the whole narrative of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, who he is, his life, what happens to him, his crucifixion, his death, all of it filters out the proud. So here are Mary and Joseph. These are not important people. These are like unknown nobodies. And they go to Bethlehem, which at the time is a very small town. I think if this was happening in today's day and age, they would have rolled in to Bethlehem in a 1998 Toyota Corolla, missing a couple of hubcaps and in need of a paint job. And nobody would think that God was doing something significant in these people in a 98 Corolla that needs a paint job. Because nobody's looking there for the significant work of God. Everybody's looking in the places of significance and importance. 
The fact that God works this way through these kind of people in these kind of places, that in its own right begins to filter out the proud. The proud say things like, I'm bigger than that. I'm more important than that. I don't deal in that low life kind of terrain. I am rich, I'm wealthy, I'm positioned, I'm important. And so the proud will get filtered out as the story moves forward. So let's talk about angels and shepherds for a minute. Angels are the glorious and shepherds for sure are the not glorious. Let's start with angels. I think for much of my Christian life, I've been quite dismissive of angels. I'm just being honest with you about this. I sort of go into somebody's house and they got something with angels on it. And I'm like, this person is kind of a Christian wacko sort of spiritualist. And I haven't paid too much attention to angels. And I sort of, you know, TV shows about angels and paintings about angels and all that kind of stuff. I have learned I have paid too little attention to angels. When the angels are mentioned here, it made me think, all right, I'm going to go do a little work on researching angels. Ready for this? References to angels appear 270 times in the Bible. That's not like one passing deal. 270 times the Bible speaks about angels or an angel. Then I'm mindful, oh my goodness, the life of Jesus Christ is bookended by this incredible ministry of angels. The angels fill the sky announcing he's here in the manger. And the angels meet the women at the tomb announcing he's not here in the tomb. It's the angels of heaven who are bookending these magnificent announcements about the person of Jesus Christ, who he is and what his life is about. The angels have come from heaven. I just think it's helpful to know that, right? Don't Hallmark movie it. The angels have come from heaven to the earth to make an announcement. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to people on whom his favor rests. There's so many juxtapositions here. This is a heaven to earth juxtaposition. And you know, it's beautiful when angels show up, they start by saying, don't be afraid. Now, I can really geek out on this and take a bunch of time and I won't. I'll just take a snippet of time. Commentators suggest that in this case, the appearance of the angels was intimidating, that they were a show of force. We tend to think of angels as, you know, cute little white-gowned, winged cherubim. But in this case, the angels are a show of force, and we'll talk about this in a moment. All right, well, let's talk about the shepherds. But before we do, I'm going to tell you about a little experience I had with a doctor's appointment this past week. So I had a routine doctor's appointment. All's good, happy about that. And so I go online to do the pre-registration for the doctor's appointment, right? With, I think it's called Freesia. Probably tons of you have done this. So I go on, you gotta answer a bunch of questions. And then it comes to a question that says, are you an essential worker? <laughs> I'm looking for ordained minister who teaches the gospel of Jesus Christ. I didn't find it. There's a whole bunch of little categories. Are you this? Are you this? Are you this? Are you this? Because if you can check one of those, then you're an essential worker. Of course, I wasn't sure, like, if I did check that, would I get some special treatment in my appointment? And since I didn't check it, did I get the low-life treatment in my appointment? I'm not sure. <clears throat> but anyway, I was not an essential worker. Shepherds were not essential workers. Now, as Pete said last week, the shepherds were first responders, but in that day, shepherds were not essential workers. A little bit on the shepherds. All the mojo with raising animals belonged to the breeders. And you can think, this is 2,000 years ago. What did those people know? They knew a lot. They lived in a farming livestock culture. They knew a lot about breeding. People who knew how to breed animals for the best results were paid a lot. They were prized in the culture. 
Those were the people that got all the attention when it came to animals and farming. Shepherds, look, here's your job description if you're a shepherd. The breeders are raising the sheep. They're doing everything where the value and the bigger salaries are. The shepherds, your job is just show up, don't be drunk, don't fall asleep, and guard the sheep. That's your job description. Show up, don't be drunk, don't fall asleep, guard the sheep. Right? Of course, you know, well, anybody could do that. I don't know. If you're a shepherd, could you get fired? I'm sure plenty of them lost their jobs because one of those criteria that probably didn't work out for them. So shepherds were non-essential workers in a sense. They weren't the valued ones. The breeders were the valued ones. The shepherds were like, just take care of the sheep and make sure none of them get lost. These were considered dirty people who lived and camped and lived outdoors and had dirt under their fingernails. So once again, we see the humble theme. The angels are going to announce this to the shepherds, right? If you want to botch a PR campaign in the year 4 BC, you would make a big announcement through shepherds. That's how you would botch a PR campaign. And so God chooses shepherds, the first ones to make the big announcement, the first ones who are going to go share this news of Jesus. And I said it a couple of weeks ago, I can't get it out of my head. Mary and Joseph have been moving through these paces, and God keeps moving and working in their lives and surprising them. Here's the thing, this is how life works with God. God doesn't tend to write you a master story and tell you everything that's going to happen and how he's going to show up and what's going to come by surprise and what he's going to teach you and how you should respond and what you should do. Mary and Joseph live a life, ready, it's this basic and this significant. They live a life of faith. Living a life of faith is a different way to live the human experience. Living a life of faith is saying, God, it is my every desire to trust you with what happens and comes to me in my life. Now, here's the challenge. Many of us were raised in relatively well-off, managerial, get a good education, run your life songs. That's the song we were taught to sing. That song is a different song than living a life of faith. Living a life of faith is, God, I trust you with what comes my way. And the longer you do it, the more you have experiences where what comes your way is stuff you never expected. Much of it is beautiful, and a lot of it is hard. And so Mary and Joseph, I think each time I can just imagine them talking with each other. What do we do now about what God has presented to us? I don't know, it's all conjecture, but I think from what I read about them, they would say things like, let's just keep staying very close to God and try to be responsive and move with the way he's leading. So they've had these several experiences, and then the birth comes, right? Of course, birth is risky. I have a close friend whose daughter had a baby a couple of weeks ago, and she had some serious complications, I think we tend to think now the birth of a baby is a piece of cake and it's going to be no problem. Serious complications. Anyway, mom and baby are fine, but almost not. So you have that hanging over, and then the baby's born, and then these shepherds show up. I just can't get it out of my head. Like, I think after a baby, you want to have a little afterglow and a little time to be together, and these shepherds show up, these no life, low life guys. And I can't help but think Mary and Joseph were like, did you invite them? Do you know them? I don't know them. Where did they come from? I don't know. Oh, it appears that God is doing something again. Let's stay very close to him and try to trust and be responsive to what he's doing. The people who believed of all these singers of the first songs, the people who believed were all unimportant people. There's only one who's an important person, that's Zechariah, and when God moved in his life, he didn't believe it. Your sense of your own importance will reduce your ability to believe God. 
Okay, so now let's move through a couple of verses. Verse 11, one of, the, one of the most incredible declarations of who Jesus is. One sentence, a remarkable economy of words chocked full of theological calorie content. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He's the Messiah, he's the Lord. Everything you need to know about Jesus in one sentence. He is the savior from sin. He's the Messiah that's been long awaited for the Jewish people. And he is Lord of all, as he said himself, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Well, then no wonder the angel said glory to God in the highest, not glory to us in the highest, not glory to me in the highest, glory to God in the highest. This is who he is. Okay, verse 12, always been a huge enigma to me, where they say, this will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in claws lying in a manger. I'm going to repeat what I've taught in the past, but I think it's important enough to do it. This will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in a manger. Like, how is that a sign? The baby's what you're looking for. That's not a sign. That's the, the thing you're looking for. A sign says Bethlehem, four miles. Not the baby wrapped in the manger, why is it a sign? I wrestled with this for a long time until I was in Bethlehem and I learned a little bit more about this. These shepherds would have been part of raising animals for the sacrificial system of Israel. What happened was when the breeders were trying to breed Passover lambs, they would try to breed lambs that had pure white wool or whatever lambs have and no spots, no blemishes, no nothing. And when one was born that was like that, they would clean it up, wrap it up, and put it in a manger, like the feed trough, to protect it from being around the other animals, getting dirty, getting scratched, getting cut. That's how they would protect a Passover perfect lamb, and they would protect it, wrap it up, and probably put it in a manger. So when the angels say to the shepherds, this will be a sign to you, you'll find a baby lying in a manger. It's it's inside language. It's like, you know, in a family where you have your own inside stories and you all know what it means, but nobody else in the house knows what it means. This is inside language. The angels know that the shepherds know how this happens. And so the angels say to the shepherds, this will be a sign to you. You find a baby wrapped in claws lying in a manger. The shepherds would have had no doubt. This is the Passover lamb. But the angels are telling us the full Passover lamb that is now here to complete the whole sacrificial system is no longer a lamb, but a baby. And his name is Jesus. Last week, Pete Boel talked about Zechariah's song. Zechariah was the father of John the Baptist. I like Pete's phrase. He said, John the Baptist had one purpose in life, and that was to declare that the Savior is here. In John 1.29, we see an example of this, and this is how John the Baptist describes Jesus the Savior. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So when the shepherds were told by the angels, you'll have a sign, it'll be a baby wrapped in claws lying in a manger. It's not going to be a lamb, it's going to be what used to be lambs that's now a person who is the full and final sacrifice to take away the sins of the world. Verse 13, suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel. A great company of the heavenly host. A friend of mine and I were playing golf the other day. We were talking about Eugene Peterson's The Message, and he said what he loves about The Message is that Eugene Peterson always translates the angels as the angel armies. And that's how this should be translated. The word in Greek is not host, whatever a host would be. I have no clue what a heavenly host would be. The word is stratia, which means army. It means the sky was filled with a heavenly army of angels. No wonder the shepherds were afraid. Why, why was the sky filled with a heavenly army of angels? Because, friends, there is a cosmic battle happening in creation between light and darkness, good and evil. This cosmic battle is the reality that underlies all that we don't see every day, but is part of what's happening in our lives. There's evil in the world, and this baby in the manger has come to defeat that evil. 
Now, when I talk about evil, I have a feeling that lands variously on different people's ears. So Pete Bowell and I have been talking a lot about this book we've been reading by Fleming Rutledge called Advent. I just got to say a little bit more. I think I've been saying snippets about her, but maybe I should just dump the whole truck. She's like in her 80s, and she's an Episcopalian minister. Much of her preaching around New York and Connecticut and all that kind of stuff. The picture I've seen of Fleming Rutledge, she's got like pearls and a Gucci scarf on. She's like the picture of an Episcopalian. And I know because our family, whenever we went to church, was Episcopalian. So Fleming Rutledge speaks like a prophet. And in one of her sermons in her book, Advent, she's speaking at an Episcopal church in Greenwich, Connecticut, one of the wealthiest zip codes in the whole world. And she says to them, if the church doesn't look squarely at the reality of evil in the world, the message of Jesus is quite pointless. All of you here were largely raised with a mindset that life is all things bright and beautiful. The only problem is the facts are that for about 80% of the world, it's all things negative and nihilistic. And I know when I talk about evil, it's hard for you to hear that. Ready for this? She said, because you still have your spring break tans from Palm Beach. I'm guessing she didn't get invited back. <laughs> Jesus Christ came because there is a cosmic battle between light and dark and good and evil. And if we dismiss that in a Hallmark movie, we're missing so much of what's happening here. And then the great outburst, verse 14, glory to God in the highest heaven. And on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. Don't miss the order. Glory to God, peace on earth. Glory to God, peace on earth. This statement, glory to God in the highest, is the Bible's greatest declaration. Now, there are many, many places where it says things like this, but this essential sentence is the Bible's greatest declaration. Glory to God in the highest. Speaking about Jesus, Jesus, this baby lying in a manger wrapped in swaddling cloths. Like, really? Like, what does it all mean? We have all of these Hebrew scriptures that have had these prophetic statements that the Hebrew people tried to understand. We have these songs that these people have been singing, the overflow of their hearts that are saying things like, Lord, may it be to me as you have said, and why should I be so blessed that you would use me to be part of bringing Christ into the world? But what does it all mean? And when the angels say glory to God in the highest, it is as though all of the pins and the tumblers in the lock have clicked into place. And glory to God in the highest is the summary reveal of all the mysteries, all the prophecies, all of the songs that these people are singing. It's like click, 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 click. And the lock opens. Jesus Christ in the manger. Glory to God in the highest. The hope of heaven has come and light is invading the darkness. And while the darkness has not yet been completely defeated, one day it will be when there is only light and the darkness has been completely eliminated. The lock has been opened, the mystery revealed, and it's a baby in a manger and the angels are shouting, singing, glory to God in the highest. John 1.14 says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Speaking of Jesus, we've seen his glory. The glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Tim Keller says, Moses had reflected the glory of God as the moon reflects the light of the sun. But Jesus produces the unsurpassable glory of God. It emanates from him. Jesus doesn't point to the glory of God as Elijah, Moses, and every other prophet has done. Jesus is the glory of God in human form. So you might be saying, 
this all is landing a little flat for me because my life feels dark and hard. Friends, if you're saying that, that's why this news means so much. He didn't come because it's all so bright and beautiful trying to add a little frosting to the cake. He came because it's hard and difficult and there is an enemy who prowls like a roaring lion seeking to devour any that he can. And so when the angels are announcing this baby in the manger, the announcement is to the shepherds, this is war, but don't be afraid. This one in the manger has come to win the cosmic battle. So when it says glory to God in the highest, I wonder how that lands for you. Let's be honest for a second. The phrase, glory to God in the highest. The humble are really happy when they hear it, but the proud are offended. When I was like 19 years old and I was not yet a Christian, I started reading the Bible. And I'm reading stuff like, all praise and honor to you, O Lord. And God deserves all praise. I'm like offended by this. I'm like, what kind of an egomaniac God positions himself so all praise and glory is flowing to him, like some tyrannical dictator? Well, if the glory of God is offensive to you, you have to ask yourself if that's because I thought the glory is mine. And when the scriptures announce that all glory is his, then I'm having to confront a glory competition. And the proud are offended when we first hear this. J.I. Packer said, vain persons put on a show with the features, physical shape, clothes, skills, position, influence, homes, brains, acquaintanceships, or whatever they are most proud of, expect applause and feel resentful and hurt if people do not play up to them and act impressed. And then you get this phrase, peace on earth to those on whom his favor rests, right? He is giving a distinct category. The distinct category is those on whom his favor rests. But the enigma of this verse is, well, who are they, right? Most of the Hallmark movie stuff just says glory to God, peace on earth. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says to those on whom his favor rests. A distinct category is being delineated here. This is a little bit disturbing, perhaps, depending on how you feel about it. But the question is, who are they? The people on whom his favor rests. You know who they are? They're the ones who agree with glory to God in the highest. They're the ones who hear that and say, yes. And for those people... There is peace because the truth of the way the cosmos is arranged, glory to God in the highest, is the devotional statement of their own heart. And that's why there's peace for them because they're living in sync with reality as the Bible is saying it. It doesn't mean it's all going to be peaches and cream. It doesn't mean there's not going to be really hard stuff. But if we're living outside of that reality, if we're living to one of those false songs early on, we'll know it's a false song when the hardships of life create all kinds of churning torque inside of us. But when glory to God in the highest is the declaration of the angels and the devotion of our hearts, we're synced up with the way things truly are. In other words, it's peace to those who believe this. But belief, I mean, what a mysterious idea, belief. What do you believe? How do you come to believe? What do you believe in? Where did you get the belief from? How did you construct your belief system? Everybody, you've heard me say it has a belief system. Here's the thing. Research, psychology, forensics reveal human beings believe what they want to be true, not what is actually true. We have a remarkable capacity to have a strongly held predisposed viewpoint that when we come to some batch of data, we will interpret it to fit it into our predisposed viewpoint. Scott Erickson says, most of us are non-convincible. 
Substantial evidence shows that human beings ignore facts that contradict what they want to believe. See any political debate in your Facebook feed. Additionally, people who want to convince you of anything are annoying. See some religious people. But you get the point. The strongly held internal desire is more persuasive to what you believe is true than what is actually true. And now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, that may be true for other people, but not for me. Because you're believing what you want to believe. And so God is coming into the world in this glorious declaration. And the great crescendo of all the songs is glory to God in the highest heaven. Yes, the order is important. Because done rightly, glory to God will make for human flourishing. Done wrongly, it'll be a bunch of bad manipulative religion. But done rightly, it will bring human flourishing. But here's the thing. A lot of people will say, oh, no, 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 that religion thing, man, that makes me so nervous. It's really glory to human beings. Because all those religious wackos, they're going to make it really bad. Here's the thing. History's track record of glory to human beings has ended up in the gulags and the concentration camps and the killing fields of Cambodia. It starts with very altruistic sounding ideologies and left to grow of their own devices, it ends up in the gulags and the concentration camps. Glory to God in the highest is the biblical declaration of the way the universe is designed with God as the creator. And for those who agree, there is peace. Not only that, it's music to their ears. So what do we do now? What do we do about the announcement of Jesus, but the fact that all of the hard, dark stuff isn't gone yet? We do what the church does, which is celebrate this glory and share it with the world in preparation for his return when that glory will come and there will be no more pain, dying, sickness, or sadness. And as J.R. Tolkien said, everything sad will become untrue. I said a few weeks ago that just as Mary was pregnant with Jesus until his birth, now the church is pregnant with Jesus until his return. Ephesians 3 speaks of the times we're living in now. Habakkuk 2 speaks of the times when he will come again. Let's hear these in close. Ephesians 3, now to him who's able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that's at work within us, to him be the glory, where? In the church, pregnant with Jesus until he returns. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ throughout all generations forever and ever. Until what? Until he returns when Habakkuk 2 is the reality. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Glory to God in the highest, friends. And peace to those on earth in whom his favor rests. Let heaven and nature sing it out. Let's pray. God, our Father, we catch glimpses that there's so much more going on here than we ever knew. I think our part, Lord, is to be like Mary and like Joseph and Elizabeth and just say, Lord, we want to trust you with faith and move with you as you move in our lives. For many of us, Lord, the unexpected have brought us pain that we didn't imagine. Could you help our lives be aligned around the one true song Yes, even our pain is part of glory to God in the highest. And so, Lord, help us as the church to experience and to celebrate this hope, this living hope in Jesus until he comes again. Amen.